morning. Morning. Good morning. I guess I should start being more specific when I talk to Doug because I keep telling him I want to be the, you know, have him roll the re roll the carpet out for me. <laughs> I should have specified and put the benches back in place. <laughs> so he, he got the carpet rolled out, just not everything put back together. <laughs> well, it's always good to be back here, be back home, and uh, share God's word with you today. I want to preach this morning. Uh, the title of my sermon is Salvation by Grace. Salvation by Grace. Uh, it's, you may think, well, that's a simple topic. But, you know, I was visiting with someone and we were talking about how, you know, Christ, his command to love one another sounds so simple. But yet man has such a difficult time putting it into practice. To, to really love one another the way that we should. Uh, is difficult for mankind to do. And to understand that we're saved by grace alone is sometimes difficult for us to understand. And I want to go through some verses in the book of Galatians to show to you what it means, salvation by grace. And two things I want to be sure to address are, what are what is positional righteousness? What does that mean? And also, what does it mean just daily living, daily walking with Christ? How are those two things related to salvation by grace? The question to ask ourselves this morning is, is salvation by grace alone? Or is there also something else we have to do to, to have salvation? And what about sanctification? Or that is, to be transformed by the Spirit. Is that done by the Spirit alone, or is it something we have to do on our side also through obedience to the law? When we understand the sufficiency of Christ and the power of grace that, transform us, that transforms us, we will understand what it means to be, to have salvation by grace. To understand salvation by grace, we also have to understand this basic foundational truth, that God is love. Now, when we say God is love, let's not get confused and think, well, that's something sappy or sentimental or touchy-feely. But God's love is the kind of love that transforms us, that changes who we are into someone different. There's something deeper to understand what God's love really is. To have a full understanding with that, we look at Galatians, if you're there in your Bibles. Galatians chapter 1, we'll start with verse 3 and 4. This is Paul writing a letter to the Galatians, and he's, he's opening up his letter with his address. And he says, verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 4, he's talking about Christ. He says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. To deliver us from this present evil age. So we're going to take what's going on in Galatia and think about our own life today. The world we live in, is it a present evil age? There's a lot of evil in our world. A lot of darkness in our world. God loves us so much that he's willing to rescue us out of that environment. To think without Christ how dark your life is. You're in complete, total darkness without the light of life, Jesus Christ, in your life. We'd be completely lost, directionless, hopeless without Jesus Christ. We needed to be rescued. That's the love of God, that he loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us and take our place for the penalty that is due to our sinful nature. So without Christ, we need to be rescued. Christ came, offered himself as a sacrifice. And what we see in Galatia is that people have taken that, that truth of the gospel that that salvation is by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, and they have, they have changed it, added to it, into something different. Which is, again, something I think we 
can say it goes on still to this day. People change the basic gospel of Christ that we are saved by faith in him alone. You notice in verse 6, Paul writes, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So that's the issue going on in Galatia, that there's people there who their background is of the Jewish faith, and they're saying, okay, we understand Christ came, and he was the Son of God, and he, crucified, he was crucified on the cross. But there's still a need to obey the law in order to have your salvation. Just what exactly were they advocating, these, these people? If, I think it gives an explanation if you look in chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to go through a few different verses around the, the letter to Galatians. But chapter 5, verse 1, let's read what it says. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It's quite clear that he's telling us we have freedom in Jesus Christ. But if you go back to observing the law for your salvation, that's likeness to bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So these Jewish people who are, they believe in Christ, but they're saying that you still need to be circumcised. Paul is saying, well, if you have to be circumcised, then if that's necessary for your salvation, then you have to keep the entire law, you have to keep the entire law and do it perfectly in order to have your salvation. And he's saying you, you become indebted to it, you're enslaved to that law. We think about the law, what does it do for us? What would it take to keep the entire law to have your salvation? Well, first, you'd have to know what the whole law is, to understand all the law, understand it perfectly. Then you'd have to perfectly keep the whole law. You'd have to do everything you, before, even more than just doing the whole law. You'd have to have a good attitude about it, too. Because what did Christ say on the Sermon on the Mount? He says, even if you have hatred in your heart for someone, you've committed murder. So it's not enough that you just don't commit murder. You have to not have hatred in your heart for anybody. See, he, Christ made breaking the law even more difficult by even your attitudes is a transgression of the law. And you think about it, it's not even the role of the law. The role of the law is not to justify and show how good you are. The role of the law is to condemn and show you really how bad you are. When you look into the law, you realize, I don't measure up to what the law is saying. And further, what the law is saying, showing that holy standard, is saying that because you don't measure up, now you've transgressed the law, therefore you're a transgressor, a lawbreaker, and if you're a lawbreaker, then you need to be punished for it. There's a penalty to be made for transgressing the law. And that penalty is, is death. The wages of sin is death. This is, this is what was going on back in those days, especially in Galatia. There's even a, a time in the Bible, if you would just read Acts chapter 15, we'll see Paul and Barnabas go before a council of elders and they're trying to answer the question, is it necessary to be circumcised? And it's Peter who stands up and says, look, we, we ourselves haven't been able to keep the whole law. We can't bear that burden of the whole law ourselves. Why should we place it upon the Gentiles that they should also keep the entire law for salvation? So if we can't bear it, why can we expect other people to bear it? I'm talking about this issue today because I think still today, people still seek another gospel. They understand that Christ came for to forgive us of our sins, but for some reason, not everyone believes that 
that's all it takes to have salvation is to believe in Jesus Christ. Isn't there more to it than that? Isn't there something more that I have to do to earn my salvation? And so you see, you seek to justify yourself and prove yourself to God. And in other words, trying to show God, I'm worthy to be loved. I'm worthy for you to choose to save me from my sins. This is something we call legalism. People who look to the law to justify themselves and find salvation. I don't know what everyone's feeling about things are here, but I know that uh, the Church of God Seventh Day, we have a lot of distinct doctrines. And that brings about the opportunity for people to be somewhat legalistic. When you look at our laws, and it's easy to slip into the thinking that, well, if I'm keeping all these laws, everyone else should too. Maybe they're not saved like I am. It's easy to, to fall back to that mentality. There's two problems with legalism. One, if, if you're a person that has a legalistic attitude towards the law and that I need to obey certain laws to earn my salvation, it can make you feel superior to other people. I feel like I'm better than other people. People were only as good as me and understood all the law like I do and obeyed the law the way that I do. Wouldn't this world be a better place? Because I'm superior. I'm better than other people. That's the mentality you develop when you're a legalist. But you know what the interesting thing is? The other thing that legalism can cause within you is a feeling of being inferior or you're not good enough. That I'm not worthy enough. I under, that I look at all God's laws and realize I fall short and I'm not worthy of salvation. I was talking to a friend of mine at Claremore and uh, he was sharing me when he grew up and he was younger. Uh, he didn't grow up in Oklahoma, but he did grow up in the Church of God. He said, you know, when I was younger, I had both of these attitudes. I'd go to school and be around my worldly friends, and I felt so much better than them that I belonged to the church that I did and that uh, I, I kept the Sabbath and I did all these things. I felt so much superior than all these others. He said, you know, when I'd go to church, I'd feel so inferior that I'd look around at other people and think, and, and realizing my own faults, I would look at other people and say, they're so much better than me. <laughs> They, they do such a better job at following God's laws than I do. And so he had both of those things work. The problem with legalism, it puts a stress on my own goodness. It also puts an emphasis on the fact that Christ is not enough for my salvation. So what's the solution to legalism? Is to understand we are saved by grace alone. We continue in Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse number 15. Let's read what Paul writes here. It says, We who are, are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So here Paul makes it quite clear. By the works of the law, we are not justified. That is not where we found our justification. Justification being that I'm a sinner by nature, but God has looked upon me and had mercy and grace upon me that he removed my sins and that he accounted his righteousness to my to me and therefore when I stand before God I am justified I have no sin in his eyes that is what we call positional righteousness when you have faith in Jesus Christ by position he looks at you and declares you are righteous you are worthy of salvation worthy of eternal life but verse 17 Paul raises this, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, 
Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. So he's answering that the people who might have a, a gotcha moment says, well, you say you're justified by Christ and you have no sin, but I still see you sometimes messing up and sometimes doing things wrong. You still have some sin. I, I, I can see it. So therefore, is Christ the cause of our sin because we believe in Christ alone for our salvation? Is he the what's causing us to sin? He's saying certainly not. It's not Christ that causes us to sin. Christ is the solution for our sin. So we have positional righteousness, but we still have, we're still tied to this old flesh. It's still, there's a work to be done within us. That's the sanctification part. That Christ is leading us through that sanctification, learning to live for him, through him. Continue on, verse 18, he says, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, if I go back to trying to find justification through the law, that is sin. That is where I am a transgressor. If I try to prove myself through my obedience to the law. Verse 19, For I through the law die to the law, that I might live to God. You see there? My old self that tried to find justification through the law, that, that old me died to the law. Here is Paul. He was a Pharisee. He, he talks about, I knew the law. I kept the law. But yet he was lost because he didn't know Jesus Christ. So why would I want to go back to trying to find my justification through the law when I find my positional righteousness in Jesus Christ? And also, it's through the power of Christ that I can live this life now in the flesh. Notice verse 20. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with him. My old nature has been crucified on the cross with him. And now I, I live as a new man, that newness of life that I have by the fact that Christ lives in me. Yet not I who live, but Christ lives in me. You have the spirit of Christ dwelling within you. You live your life now because Christ is in you and has made you into a new person. Later in Galatians, in chapter 5, there's those famous passage of scripture talking about the fruit of the spirit if you walk in the spirit you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh but you will bear the fruits of the spirit you live a life now that has the lord god living within you through his spirit and that's where you find your sanctification that i i no longer fulfill the lust of the flesh because i'm now walking in the spirit verse 21 I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law then Christ died in vain right there he answers the question if I could find my righteousness in the law then what was the purpose of Christ dying on the cross that he would have died in vain there had been no reason for him to die on the cross if it wasn't good enough completely for my salvation Christ did not do anything in vain. There was a purpose for his being here. And the purpose is because the Lord loved us and sent him to die on the cross to take away our sins and give us righteousness. We've been talking about positional righteousness that God looks at us, considers us righteous, we also know, too, as I mentioned, that a Christian is not somebody who has no sin, but it is somebody whom God no longer accounts sin. So, yeah, I still have sin because I'm tied to the sinful flesh. I still have that, that nature of Adam within me. But I now have the Spirit of Christ living within me, too. So I don't have my sins accounted to me. And now, because I have Christ within me, I can now live a truly godly life through the power of Jesus Christ, not through my own power. 
And this is transformational. This is how God changes your life. When you believe in Christ, He'll change your life to make you something different than you were before. You've been crucified with Him, the old self. Now you've been raised up, resurrected into someone new. Yes, you are a, a new creature in Jesus Christ. I'll, I'm going to go ahead and read the first few verses of chapter 3. Because he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So he's, he's making the point. The work that God started in you through the Spirit is not completed by your, your own works of the flesh, by your own obedience of the law. Now we say all these things, but we also know too, because you have this new nature in Jesus Christ, you are now going to have a spirit of wanting of obedience. You're going to want to obey God's laws. Because why? Because now you're a, a really a godly person. And you realize that God's laws are good for you. And his truths are wonderful to learn. So we can have the light of the truth and not be walking in darkness. So we don't find within the law our justification. We don't find within the law our salvation. We do find through the law God's love for us to show us how to live. It's because of his love that he gave us the law. The law versus love is always a difficult thing to try to explain. And I was thinking and thinking and thinking, how can I best explain it? And I think I've come up with the best possible solution through a little story uh, that involves my, well, I was about to say my little cousin. <laughs> he was little at the time. He was like two or three years old, but now he's a grown 21-year-old. <laughs> So this is my Aunt Jennifer, her son, named Ashton. He was about two or three years old. And once, I think it was a Sabbath day, we, after church, we all went up to their house to have lunch. And we show up there, uh, the whole family's gathering for a big, a big lunch. And uh, lunch is, is being cooked in the kitchen there. And... Uh, being who I am, being a snoop, I decide I'm going to go in the kitchen and kind of see what's on the stove. <laughs> so what, what, what are you having for dinner? You know, that's the big question. And so I'm over at the stove lifting lids on pots or whatever, trying to figure out what we're having. And as I'm at the stove and I'm touching things on the stove, this little two or three year old boy comes running up to me, shaking his finger at me and says, don't touch it. <laughs> don't touch it. It's hot. It's hot. See, he had been instructed by his mother, <laughs> do not touch the stove, it's hot. Because <laughs> she knew full well if he reached up with his little hands, he would touch that burner on that stove and burn his hand and he'd walk around with scorched fingers. <clears throat> As I think about that story, I think I can see this example of God's love for us and how we're to obey him through the law. Think about it from the mother's perspective. Did she, why did she give that law to that child? Because she loved him. She doesn't want, didn't want him to be hurt. Didn't want him to be injured. So she gave that for good reason, because she loved him. She did not give the law in order to test her child to see if that child really loved her. Even if that child had reached up and touched that hot stove and burned himself, she would have still loved her child anyway. So her mom, the mom did not give the, the command in order to have her child prove his love for her. She simply gave it because she loved her child. And if we look at that story from the child's perspective, we think about this. If his attitude was, I need to obey my mom to earn her love, then he would not touch the stove. In fact, he might actually think, you know what, I'm not even going to step foot in that kitchen. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be wise for me to go in that kitchen. In fact, he might even think, well, I wouldn't even go to that end of the house because the stove's down at that end of the house. 
And I better play it safe and not go to the end of the house. In fact, I'd know even better. I wouldn't even go inside the house anymore. I'd just, I'd start living outside. <laughs> because there's a stove in there that might burn me. And I'm going to obey my mom. And this is a way I can really show her that, that uh, and I can really prove to her that I'm worthy of her love if I don't even go inside the house. That will show her that, I, that I'm really worthy to be loved by her. But you see, that mentality, what it's slipping into, that's kind of like that legalistic attitude that I was talking about, where I'm so strict with the law that I don't enjoy life. I was talking to another friend, uh, Claire Moore, and he was telling me when he grew up, uh, he, his home was very legalistic. And but he said, you know, it's just the way we lived in my my family's home, and it's the, it's the only way I knew of life. And I even he grew up, got married, went to church, still, and still had that legalistic attitude. And he said, one day it just hit me, I was so bored with church. We just do the same thing over and over, and I'm just doing it for obeying the law. And he did not. He said, I never really felt the true love of God. Nobody ever expressed to me that God loved me. And it got to the point that he said, I was bored with life. And so he quit church and went off into the world because he was trying to find something that made him satisfied or happy. You see, that's the problem with legalism. It, it removes God's love for us. But you also think from the child's perspective, if they have the attitude, well, if my mom loves me anyway, I can do whatever I want. What's going to happen? They're going to end up with scorched palms. <laughs> burnt fingers they're going to have a difficult time and that's another way I think why we should be obedient to God's laws because he's loved us enough to give us laws to show us the way we should live otherwise we're going to find ourselves in a lot of ruin in life and a lot of heartache because we haven't listened to the, the wisdom that God has given to us because he loved us so my message today is to let you know that you don't need to try to earn God's love through your obedience to the law. He loves you anyway. You realize you're saved by grace. That love will transform you into a different kind of person. Instead of trying to earn and justify God's love, we should just receive it and let his love transform us into the kind of godly people that he intends for us to be. Amen. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Our precious and kind Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I come before your throne of grace this morning and thanking you for all you do for us. But most importantly, Lord, I'm thanking you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, even while we were still sinners. And Lord, that you loved us so much to not leave us where we are, but to show us a new way of life in obedience to you and bear the fruits of the Spirit and experience all the love, peace, and joy that you have in store for us. And most importantly, Lord, for salvation and one day eternal life with you. I pray for all my loved ones who are in the world trying to find satisfaction in the world. And I ask you, Lord, to please bear with them, be patient, and draw them back to you. I pray for the salvation of all my unsaved loved ones. So Lord, I pray for this and I do it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, do I pray. Amen. God bless you.